Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful morning in Northwest Arkansas. Um, and uh, welcome to the fall series for seminars for the Institute for Integrative and Innovative Research at the University of Arkansas. I cubed R, the big cube on top of the I. Don't forget that. So um, I think uh, last year I mentioned a little bit about I cubed R. And since today is the first seminar series, I'll just mention uh, a little bit about IQPR. I'm Ranu Jang. I'm the executive director of this institute. Here are several members from the institute and faculty members. And uh, I hope that on Zoom are not just uh, University of Arkansas folks, but also folks from our community and industry members. The institute, uh, as you many of you know, uh, we are very fortunate to have had a transformational gift that has allowed this institute to be formed. And our mission is to make sure that we are engaged not only with the academic community, but with our industry and clinical partners and the rest of the community. Five words define us, convergence, integration, innovation, economic development, and at scale. So we are very, very happy that this very first talk that we have got today brings many of those things together. We have said we will take on wicked problems and grand challenges. And our first big grand challenge is, is integrative health. Food is important, exercise is important, how we sleep is important, <laughs> our behavior is important, and all of that going together allows us to get well health. And uh, movement, without which we would not be alive, is absolutely core. So with that, I would like to introduce to you our very first speaker, and it is a delight to welcome Professor Kevin Murat today to this launch the fall series. Uh, uh, Kevin got his undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He did a master's in exercise physiology at James Madison University in Harris Harrisonburg, Virginia. He got his PhD in human bioenergetics <laughs> from the Ball State Human Performance Lab in Muncie, Muncie? Muncie Indiana. And then he spent time as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Kentucky Center for Muscle Biology in Lexington. His lab, as you can see, labeled right here, M3R. I think I cubed R. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> molecular muscle mass regulation lab uses molecular biology techniques to study muscle mass regulation in the context of exercise, adaptation, aging, and disease. So you can see he's not just looking at disease, he's looking at basic science and bringing it together, exercise that we all know we should be doing. How many steps are you going to do today? You know, so it's really a pleasure to bring Kevin to come in today to talk to us and launch us on what we are hoping that all of us can buy into is a good, healthy lifestyle and that that is all going to promote well health for us. Um, so I just also want to just tell you that we are going to continue conversations around food, health, all of that as it converges together over the rest of this semester and following into the next semesters. So just a sneak preview, we are going to have two conversations on October 6th and October 13th. The October 6th one is going to be about creating sustainable food systems. It's going to bring in nonprofit, industry, and university partners together in a conversation. And on October 13th, we are going to talk about food and well being. And there we are going to bring in food science from rope swing and then health providers all together. So I think it's going to be a fantastic year. I hope you all are also going to find that. And um, let's welcome Kevin. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for that very, very generous introduction. I was very pleased to have been invited to give this lecture today. And so uh, it's exciting to kind of see what's going on over here in the IQ DAR and what type of things uh, you're working on. So it sounds like my work sort of dovetails with some of that. So it'll be exciting to share kind of what we're up to. So I'm an assistant professor. Uh, I started my lab in 2021. So this is uh, the beginning of year three for me. And so uh, the name of my lab, lab is N3R, as Ronnie said. And uh, the title of this talk is Metabolic Health, Aging, and Exercise, Understanding MIC and Muscle. So I like to begin uh, my lectures for the, for the non-muscle aficionados by kind of giving this just global slide about why I think skeletal muscle is important and why I like to study it. 
So you can uh, travel through the ancient world and you can see these, you know, really nice uh, statues of people that seem to be very fit and healthy, uh, very buff, if you will. Um, there seem to be, there has been, I think, a fascination throughout history with skeletal muscle and its form and function. I think that's demonstrated by these, these really old statues. But uh, this is uh, a little cartoon of uh, one of the best wrestlers of antiquity. His name was Milos of Croton. And so uh, this is probably one of the first examples of, of what we call progressive overload with resistance exercise. So I tend to view almost everything through the lens of resistance training. I'm a bit of a meathead. I've always liked to lift weights. And so, um, and that's, you know, translated into my uh, professional interests and my academic interests as well. But as the story goes, Milos, when he was a child, he had a bull that he used to carry around with him. And as uh, the bull grew, he also grew. And by the time he was an adult, as you can see, he was very, very large and muscular and was a very dominant wrestler as a consequence of this. And uh, apparently at some point uh, in his adulthood, he ate the bull in one entire sitting, probably to support his protein synthesis. Uh, <laughs> from his but um, but it, again, it's one of the... the probably the first, you know, kind of examples of progressive resistance exercise. So the idea that when you lift weights, you start light and you eventually build up. And as the weights get heavier, you get stronger and bigger. And that's one of the, uh, the principal tenets of, of weight training. But why study muscle? I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, I think, you know, for most people that don't think about muscle very often, you just think about it as the way you get around, contraction. Muscles contract in order to, so you can ambulate and get from A to B. And that definitely does that. And as one as probably as primary function, but it's important for a variety of other things as well. It's important for thermoregulation. So when you shiver, that's um, little muscle contractions generating heat. Um, it's a metabolic sink. It's a depot for amino acids, but also a, um, a depot and a disposal site for um, glucose, um, stored glucose and glycogen. Uh, it functions as an endocrine organ. It releases things called myokines. So these are essentially hormones that can communicate well throughout the body. And there's myokines that are also called exerkines, which are released from muscle in response to exercise. And they can go communicate all throughout the body, the brain, the heart, the liver, and help all those other organs to become healthier as well. And so uh, that's a, a big uh, area of research that's emerged in the last 20 years or so. Um, skeletal muscle is very heterogeneous. So it's comprised of slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers. And this is kind of a general characterization. There's more than just that. But in general, slow and fast twitch, the slow twitch tend to be more oxidative and fatigue resistant. So think like marathon runners. Fast twitch muscle tends to be more powerful and stronger. So think like sprinters. Most muscles are a mix of the two, um, but depending on what you do and how you train, those things can shift around, which uh, kind of brings me to the next point. It's very plastic. Skeletal muscle can change very quickly, so it can grow in response to resistance training, but it can also atrophy if you don't use it, and this can happen on the order of weeks to months. And you can also change the cellular componentry of your muscle, so you can switch from slow to fast twitch, fast to slow twitch, depending on what you're doing. And so it's a very, very adaptable and plastic tissue. It's a syncytium which means it's multinucleated. So most cells in the body have one nucleus, right? It's a small cell with one nucleus. Muscle is not that way. Muscle is a very, very long tube and it has hundreds to thousands of nuclei in it, which makes it really interesting to study um, just thinking about how those nuclei have to coordinate to maintain homeostasis in a muscle fiber. But at the same time, it also makes it very challenging to study, which I will uh, expound upon here shortly. Um, muscle also has fusogenic properties. So muscle has a resident stem cell population within it. So if you were to severely damage your muscle, the muscle can actually regenerate, regenerate itself. So things like chopping a lizard's tail off and generating a new tail. Muscle can kind of do a similar thing where if you damage it severely, it can literally regenerate itself. And that's due to these stem cells. And that, um, that regenerative function of muscle does decline over time because typically those stem cells will die and go away. But if you exercise, it helps to maintain that regenerative capacity. So it's a, it's a very uh, it's very interesting for that reason. So it can regenerate, but also um, those stem cells can fuse into the muscle fiber to contribute new nuclei to existing muscle fibers. And I'll I'll show you that in just a minute. But um, basically, the nuclei that are in the muscle fiber are thought to be post-mitotic, and they can't replenish themselves. So you need a stem cell population to help replace damaged or nuclei or add new ones if the muscle is growing. Um, so in my view, muscle is really at the center of whole body health um, and is important for uh, mediating your lifespan. It's uh, pretty well established that muscle strength, muscle function correlates pretty well with mortality. So um, for these reasons, for personal and professional reasons, I enjoy studying muscle. I think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about epigenetics today. So I want to just have a couple definitions so we all get on the same page before I carry on. So for the sake of this talk, I'm going to talk about epigenetics as the study of gene expression changes caused by modifications of gene accessibility rather than alterations of the genetic code itself. So we're just talking about how genes get access, not changing the genes themselves. And I like, and that comes with a lot of different flavors. I mean, you can study epigenetic regulation of DNA at a variety of different levels. 
I tend to study it at the level of um, the nucleotide, so on the DNA and methylation of specific um, cytosines in the DNA. So methylation um, can regulate gene expression through basically putting on these little, these little molecules that stick to the DNA and that can prevent genes from being expressed or promote them being expressed. And so that's called DNA methylation. I specifically generally focus on uh, CPG methylation of promoter regions. And in broad strokes, when we're talking about methylation of promoter regions, hypermethylation, so having a lot of methylation in, a, in an area that promotes gene expression, generally results in less gene expression. And vice versa, if you have less methylation in a promoter region, it can tend to result in more gene expression. And that's just very broad strokes. It's, it's a very complicated regulation, but in broad strokes, that, that generally holds true. And to measure DNA methylation, we use a couple different techniques, one of which is the least representation by sulfide sequencing. So also you know, show you some ROVS data um, from muscle here in just a little bit. So with this presentation, I aim to address these three questions. One, does muscle fiber nuclear or myonuclear CPG DNA methylation change with exercise training? So is this methylation in the muscle fiber adaptable with exercise? That's our first question. Second question, can exercise training make age skeletal muscle younger at the epigenetic level? So that's a concept I'll expound upon a little bit, but it's this interesting idea that methylation age corresponds to biological age and could be manipulated to kind of make you almost younger in some ways. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then what mediates epigenetic rejuvenation and can it be leveraged in muscle with exercise? So that's the last question um, we'll try to address with this talk. So, oopsies, I like taking images of muscle. So this is a muscle fiber here. We took this on a, on a confocal microscope. Um, so a little, a little background on muscle biology. So this talk kind of makes more sense to you. Hopefully I kind of elaborate on some of these things already, but it helps to see a visual. So this is an individual muscle fiber that I teased out from a mouse muscle. So I got on the microscope with some tweezers and these things are thinner than a human hair. And I tweezed one of these out. Um, and this is what a muscle fiber looks under the microscope. This, the green is the long tube and all inside of this is all the contractile material. So this is how um, you get from A to B. These muscle fibers get shorter and longer. Um, and that's how you move. Uh, that's how your joints move and your bones move is by contraction of these small muscle fibers. Um, but when you tease out an individual muscle fiber, what you'll see is that there's actually a lot of cells that will adhere to the muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber is green and all these cells on the outside are not within the muscle fiber. Because um, there's ECM surrounding, extracellular matrix surrounding the muscle fiber. So things tend to stick to it. Um, and then we also have these satellite cells. So these are the muscle stem cells I was referring to earlier. I spent my whole postdoc six years studying just these stem cells and what they do. Um, but what we did in this particular uh, image is we used a genetically modified mouse model to fluorescently label the satellite cells or the muscle stem cells so that we can then um, run them through a machine where it'll just sort those fluorescent cells for us and then put them in a tube and it makes them makes it very easy to study these um, when you use that technique. And you can actually label them with antibodies and do the same thing. So you can literally like mince up a muscle and get these cells with very high purity by putting them through what's called a cell sorter. Um, so that's what we did here just to show where those stem cells are, are, are sitting on the muscle fiber. And then within the muscle fiber are all the myonuclei. So the prefix myo means muscle. So these are the nuclei within the skeletal muscle fiber, the myonuclei. And as you can see, inside the muscle fiber, there's, you know, probably just in this image, there's a hundred of those within this very long individual cell. So just for perspective, though, I mean, this right here is one individual stem cell. This right here is one individual muscle fiber. So you can see that there's a huge difference in how muscle is set up versus how all the other cells essentially in the body are set up. Most of them look like this. Muscle looks like this. And because of that, though, because it's relatively easy to tag an individual cell and sort it and get it as a purified population, um, that's not really necessarily true for the muscle fiber. You can't basically tease out the muscle fibers and put them through a machine and get a pure muscle fiber at the end that you can study. So instead, what you have to try and do is label the myonuclei on the inside and then extract those out from the muscle fiber. So it's a little bit tricky and it makes studying muscle challenging. So when I was a postdoc, this paper was published, I think, in 2018. Uh, John McCarthy, Charlotte Peterson, who were my mentors, along with a whole bunch of my uh, postdoc and doc student buddies, uh, published this paper where um, John and Charlotte developed this mouse model where the important thing to remember about it, and it's, it's, it's a complicated mouse model, so I'm not going to get into the nuance of it unless you're really interested, we can talk about it later. But um, the important thing about this mouse model is that we can control gene expression only in the muscle fiber at will. 
So basically what we can do is we can give doxycycline in the water, which is kind of the trigger for controlling the gene expression. And when we put doxycycline in the water and the mice drink it, it can turn on a gene of our choice or maybe several genes of our choice only in the muscle fiber. So it gives us really exquisite control over the, what's being expressed only in the muscle. And so it's a really beautiful tool and we use it to great effect. In this um, particular paper though, all we did is we crossed our muscle controlling mouse to a mouse where we just wanted to express a green fluorescent protein. And what that does, if you express green fluorescent protein only in the muscle fiber, it will label all of the muscle fiber nuclei and make them green. So perfect. That means I can use this tool to isolate out the myonuclei while leaving behind all those other cells I don't want to study. So what we do is we just take a mouse after it's been labeled, um, the GFP positive myonuclei have been labeled already. So we just take the muscle, we do a really quick fruit nuclear extraction procedure. We take that over to our um, cell sorter, but not, in this case, it's actually nuclear sorting. So, um, but it's called a cell sorter. And basically what that cell sorter does, it looks for fluorescence. And if it finds a green nucleus, it'll just spit it into one tube. And everything else that's not labeled green, it'll spit into another tube. So we can get a really pure population of the green myonuclei, which we know um, if they're green, we know that they're myonuclei. Um, and then we can, you know, put them on a plate and we can do all types of things with them, molecular analysis, whatever we want downstream, only on the nuclei from the muscle fibers. So it's a really, uh, it's a really nice tool for us to, to extract myonuclei and study them. So, um, and we have the ability to do this in my lab too. I have my own sorter and we can do all of these things. So, um, so that's really great. So the next question is, I'm interested in studying exercise. I'm interested in studying muscle hypertrophy. How can you exercise train a mouse? So we have this really nice genetically modified mouse model, but now we need to exercise train them, right? And so truth is, mice are pretty stubborn. They don't lift weights. They're, they can't really operate. They condition them. Um, they're not like rats. Rats can teach to do things. Other animals you can teach to do stuff. Mice, they, they don't learn. Um, they're not terribly clever. So, um, so we had to think of something different. So this is what we came up with. And this was a, a project I did while I was a postdoc with my, um, my now collaborator, Corey Dungan, who's faculty at Baylor College or Baylor University now. Uh, we came up with this thing called progressive weighted wheel running or power. That's what I'll refer to it as um, moving forward. So basically, um, there have been other wheel running models out there where essentially you like apply a brake to a running wheel. But the problem with that is that once you just put a little bit too much tension on the wheel, the mouse or the wheel won't really move in the more, anymore and the mouse can't get it to go. So they just stop running all together. So that's not what we wanted. So instead what we did is we um, put basically magnetic weights just on one side of the wheel and we just modified the existing wheels we had. So this was this is not special technology or anything. I mean, those wheels are like 25 years old. And we just put like a, a little weight on one side and they sold magnet one gram weights and we can put one gram, two grams, three grams and do it over time and progressively <laughs> build them up. And um, so the wheel, though, because the way we weight the wheels unbalanced, I'll show you a video here, but it causes the mice to kind of stumble and fall repeatedly. But because they're stubborn, they'll just go again. And it's kind of like they're doing sets and reps all night long. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty nice. So we can gradually increase the weight over time. We can get them up to like 30 percent of their body weight on the wheel. They'll still run 10, 12 kilometers a night with that amount of weight on the wheel. So it's pretty phenomenal. It's minimally injurious. It trains the whole hind limb. It encourages continued training. And those signs of the adaptations are reversible true, so we uh, are reversible as well. So we can stop them from training and then looked at the de-adaptation response as well, which is something we've done. Um, and so, yeah, and we, I, during COVID, when I was bored, I published a whole review on all the methods for resistance training your mouse. But uh, we, we focused on power because we think it works really well. But you can see here, hope this video will work. Okay, so there's a, you can see on the back side there, there's a, a little wave. And so it's unbalanced. So the mice will start running, running, running. The mouse will run, and then it'll kind of have to stop. <laughs> and then it'll go again. And so it'll start running, running, running. Mm -hmm. It flips over the wheel again, and it'll stop, and that's start again. Basically, every time it starts the wheel, it's using its muscles, it's using its forelimb and hind muscles to get the wheel to start again. And it's pushing against that resistance to get it started, but then they have to stop. And so they just kind of do that all night long. And so it, it works quite well. And I'll show you some data from, uh, we published numerous studies um, doing this. Um, these are the first two studies that we published uh, using this model. But um, we just wanted to kind of get a sense for how well this works, right? For an exercise training model for mice. So we took female mice and we power trained them for two months and we just built up their um, resistance over time. And uh, then we euthanized the mice and we harvested their tissues and we did our typical analyses for um, skeletal muscle. So these are a couple images here. On the left, this is the plantaris muscle. So this is more of like a fast switch power producing muscle, like a sprinter muscle, so to say. 
And this is the soleus muscle. It's more of a postural muscle, so it's um, more oxidative and more fatigue resistance. And what you will probably notice right off the bat is this is untrained, power trained, untrained, power trained. Muscle got a lot bigger. So the muscle hypertrophy. So basically it does serve as a resistance training protocol for the mice. The other thing you'll notice is the difference in colors. And so in the untrained mouse, in the plantaris, you have mostly type 2B fibers, which are these like really uh, glycolytic, fast twitch um, type of fibers, and they're quite um, fatigable. And then over time, after the training, the muscle fibers got bigger, but also we see a higher propensity or a higher proportion of these type 2A fibers, which are fast twitch as well, but they're a lot more oxidative and they're a lot more fatigue resistant. And we saw the same thing in the soleus. There's a different fiber type to begin with in the soleus, uh, different distribution. That's a mix of type one and type two. But at the end of training, um, the muscle fibers again were bigger, but we saw an increase in these type one fibers, which are these more oxidative fatigue resistant muscle, fi muscle fibers as well. So in effect, what we've done after eight weeks of training is turned our mice into athletes. Because this is the kind of the fiber type profile you expect to see in a high level athlete. And um, the muscles are also bigger and stronger. And so it, it really does function quite nicely as uh, an exercise training analog for, uh, for if we wanted to study humans. So uh, that was the first challenge, was trying to find this exercise model. Cool, we were able to, to work that out. We've published at least 10 papers now using this model, I think. So this brings us to the question, does myonuclear DNA methylation change with exercise training? So we have the mouse model where we can label myonuclei, and now we have the exercise training model where we can actually exercise those mice. So now we can answer our question. So does myonuclear methylation change with exercise training? What we do is we label the myonuclei at the beginning of training. So you can see this is an image of a muscle histochemical cross-section. Um, and we label the myonuclei there. And then we wait, and then we power train them for eight weeks. And this is what we saw. So we grabbed the myonuclei, we sorted them, and we subjected them to DNA methylation analysis. Then we wanted to look at promoter methylation um, across the genome. And so what we found is that after exercise training, um, the myonuclei of the mice had hypomethylation in the promoter regions of NFF, nf cap signaling pathways and wind signaling pathways. So these are two things that are known to be modulated by exercise training. And now we're showing that this could be regulated at the epigenetic level, which is quite interesting. And then over here, we saw hypermethylation of promoter uh, CPGs um, in ribosomal proteins. And we're not 100% sure why that is. We think so basically, as you exercise, you make more ribosomes. We think you probably get to a point where you don't need them anymore, and the muscle is pretty much capped out. And so um, at that point, you didn't really need more ribosomes anymore or ribosomal proteins to go with them. Something like that. We don't 100% know yet. But I think the take-home point here, though, is that we were able to show that within muscle fibers, it seems like exercise can change the methylation landscape. So that was kind of the first, um, the first thing for us, is seeing, okay, does methylation even change with exercise in the muscle fiber? Yes, it does. Okay, so that, that kind of opens up the door for us to do some more studies. Renu, do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, could you explain a little bit what does methylation do and what do ribosomal proteins do? Sure. Okay, so so methylation, lots of things can be methylated in the cell, right? I'm talking specifically about um, the DNA itself being methylated, specifically cytosine. So in your DNA sequence, you have cytosines. And if you get methylated, a methylated cytosine in a promoter region, that can um, reduce gene expression, but if, or it can reduce the likelihood of a gene being expressed. But if you remove that methylation, you can increase the likelihood of that gene being expressed. So we did look at gene expression here too. I'm not going to show you the data. I only have so much time. But, um, and it did, there was correspondence. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's a, an epigenetic way to control gene expression. And as far as ribosomal proteins go, so the ribosome is like the construction worker of the cell, right? In fact, 85% of the RNA, so of the transcript, the message in your muscle that becomes protein is actually not even protein coding. It's ribosomal RNA because you need to have ribosomes to make protein so that your muscle can adapt. And so um, these ribosomal proteins, though, they say that they decorate the ribosome and they actually have very specific functions and do all types of things. But it, the concentration of ribosomal proteins can also sort of be a readout of how many ribosomes you have. And that typically does change with exercise as well. But um, the down regulation of these specific ribosomal proteins, I don't know um, why that is exactly. Again, it could be related to the fact that, you know, the muscle had enough, but it could be related to a lot of things. It could be related to ribosome specialization, which is a whole other conversation I could have. But um, but yeah, um, but the ribosome is a super, super important for hypertrophic adaptation because it dictates protein synthesis levels. So if you have more ribosomes, you can make more protein, right? And so, um, and uh, so I don't want the take home to be, you know, <laughs> ribosome synthesis went down. I don't think that's the case. We just think that was kind of maybe more refined, refined response at the methylation level um, to exercise training. But, um, but yeah, does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay.
So take homes from this first part here. We, uh, we presented a new mouse model for exercise training called power. And we saw that power shifts muscle fiber type to a healthier profile. So more of like an athlete phenotype, bigger, stronger, um, more oxidative, more metabolically healthy. Um, promoter CPG DNA methylation and myonuclei is altered by exercise training. So we, it had been shown before that when you take muscle tissue with all the different cells in it, more than just the muscle, the satellite cells, the fibrogenic cells, the macrophage, all the different things that are in muscle other than the muscle fiber, that does change. But now we know this change specifically happening within the muscle fiber. And then changes in myonuclear DNA and methylation may underpin the beneficial effects of exercise in muscle. And so uh, that's, uh, that's a big question to answer because methylation is a very complicated thing to determine the regulation of. And I'm trying to do that now in my lab, um, which I'll get to at the end. But uh, this is at least kind of our first inkling that, okay, maybe exercise training responses can be controlled by how genes are being accessed via DNA methylation. So we doing okay? We have any questions? Okay, cool. If you do, just, you know, chime in. Okay, so the next question, can exercise make age cell muscle younger at the epigenetic level? So in order to answer that question, we first had to figure out, can we exercise train aged mice? Everything I've shown you up to now with power training was in young mice, so about four months old, right? So now we had to answer the question, will old mice even do this? Old mice tend not to exercise as much. They tend not to adapt quite as well to exercise. Same thing happens with kids. And so um, we wanted to see if we exercise train, we power train these old mice, would they even run? Because if they don't run, then we're already in a bad spot. So we put them on the wheels when they were 22 months old. So that's uh, 65, 70-ish years old in the game equivalent. Mouse lifespan is only about two to three years. So, um, And so when we're training it for two months, we're actually, or two months, we're training for a pretty significant portion of their lifespan relative. But um, in any case, we uh, we exercise train them for uh, eight weeks. And then we saw that, yeah, they run quite a lot. If the young mice run 10 to 12 kilometers a night, these old mice will run six to eight which is amazing when you really think about it. That's every night they're running six to eight kilometers, right? Yeah, go tell a human being to do that. Right? So, um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty active. Um, and then we phenotyped um, the mice and their muscles. So this is a uh, body weight here on the y-axis, control versus the powertrain. Body weight went down a little bit, which is great. They were exercising, they lost weight, they're leaner, you know, that's wonderful. Um, the soleus muscle, which is that more um, fatigue resistant muscle, we saw an increase in mass of that muscle. And we didn't really see a huge uh, increase in the mass of the plantaris, which is that more glycolytic muscle I was telling you about. Um, and that didn't necessarily come as a surprise to us because it's been shown time and time again in humans that the glycolytic muscle fibers don't really adapt when we get older. And so, um, so that was interesting. Like, okay, that seems to be consistent with what we see in humans as well. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, but then we went and did our um, immunohistochemistry analysis. So when I showed you those images of the, the muscle cross-sections, we went and did that analysis. We saw that the muscle fiber CSAs and the soleus, so the cross-sectional areas increase. That's what's here on the y-axis. And then we did it by fiber type and saw the type 1 and the type 2A fibers grew. So we had that nice training response from these older mice. And the plantaris, we actually did see an increase in fiber size at the cellular level, even though it didn't show up at the uh, muscle weight level. And that's because there was a fiber type shift from bigger fibers to smaller fibers. But if you looked on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, you actually see that there was some growth in specific fiber types in the muscle. So it's a little confusing, but it actually does make sense when you think about distribution of fiber type versus fiber size, but just take my word for it. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so yeah, but it, it seemed like old mice will train and they do adapt. And so then we can use this tool now to study how ex old mice can adapt to exercise and try to find some ways that we can maybe uh, leverage things that are changing with exercise to help people to exercise better or people that can't exercise, maybe try and help to develop therapeutics um, that could help them to have exercise adaptations without necessarily having to exercise. So, um, so that's kind of what we're trying to get at with all this at the end of the day. And so I'm talking about making muscle younger at the epigenetic level. So what does that even mean? I'm sure you're probably asking yourself because I asked myself this too. So um, I put this paper up here. This was a paper published in 2011 by Steve Forbath, who was at UCLA and now is at Altos Laboratories. But he made this really interesting observation where he found that DNA methylation, so basically how genes are accessed, changes systematically throughout your lifespan. So I could go and I could take a saliva swab or a skin sample from each and every one of you and run it through this very specific methylation assay, and I'd be able to accurately predict what your age is without knowing your age. I'd be able to say you are this age you are, and do it quite accurately. And this has been shown across the entire animal kingdom now. 
So it seems like there's this, these methylation changes that happen throughout the lifespan in a very systematic way. And this is what we call DNA methylation aging. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, if there's a disconnect between your methylation age and your chronological age, that could be indicative of your health. And so if you were, let's say, 50 years old, but you had a really unhealthy lifestyle and your methylation age predicts you at 75, that could be an instance of accelerated aging. That's not necessarily good. Vice versa, if you were 50 years old and had a methylation age of 35 because you had a very healthy lifestyle, that could be indicative of the fact you might have a better health span throughout your life or potentially even have a longer lifespan. And so these are the things we're trying to figure out now, or really Dr. Steve Horvath is trying to figure out. But there's been a lot of different clocks, methylation clocks that have been developed, tons of different algorithms, it's a whole area of research. But um, I was interested in this idea um, in the context of exercise and aging. And this original paper from Steve Horvath has already been cited 4,000 times. So it's made, he's made a huge impact on the field so far. So we want to answer the question, the simple question, does exercise late in life change methylation age? Very simple question. We're going to use our power model to do this. So we exercise trained our old mice from 22 to 24 months of age. They're running six to eight kilometers a night. We grabbed their muscle. We isolated their DNA. We sent it out for this methylation aging analysis. And our first pass analysis, um, so on the x-axis here, we have methylation age in weeks. And then on the y-axis, we have the power group, so the exercise train group and the sedentary group. And what you'll see is that the power train group had about an eight-week lower methylation age relative to the age match sedentary. So this could be indicative of, I don't want to call it a reversal of aging, but, you know, the idea that the muscle, muscle at this methylation level is appearing younger. And so, um, and that was really interesting. And we had like, you know, an outlier over here and we didn't exclude it because we couldn't find a reason to. So still don't really know, but it kind of bothered us. And we also used this, um, this proprietary epigenetic aging algorithm uh, through this company called Zymo. And we wanted to have uh, a different look at this. We wanted to use something that was a little bit more, I guess, transparent. And so we teamed up with Steve Forbath, who I presented on the previous slide. And we did the same study over again, which with a much larger N, we more than doubled the, the sample size and used some very specific clocks that he had developed recently and found the exact same thing. When you exercise train, at least these mice late in life, their methylation age goes down. And so now we're trying to sort of understand the complicated or the implications of this because we, we're not 100% sure yet. But we do know that as you exercise, your muscles get bigger, your muscles get stronger. There's all these different benefits to exercise. And it could be in part mediated by this changed methylation age that we're seeing. So part two conclusions here, age vice respond well to power with pronounced adaptations in the soleus, the more modest adaptations in the plantaris muscle. DNA methylation age is lower with late life exercise um, in skeletal muscle. And could this be indicative of a lower biological age, which would translate to perhaps longer health span and maybe even potentially increased lifespan? And how could exercise be lower in DNA methylation age? That's the next question. That's what I kind of became interested in. That's what this most recent grant sort of about is trying to figure out what could be mediating these responses. So let's talk about epigenetic rejuvenation. I put in quotes because I think it's a little bit of a nebulous term, but I'll use it for the sake of today. Um, so back in 2006, this guy named Shinya Yamanaka made this really interesting discovery, which is that you can introduce these factors called now called Yamanaka factors, um, into a differentiated cell and cause them to become an induced pluripotent stem cell. So that's a really big deal, right? So basically you can take a skin cell or some other type of cell that has a true identity already that's gone through its differentiation process, and you can introduce OX34, KLF4, SOX2, and MIC into those cells, and they will revert back to a pluripotent stem cell. So that's amazing because then you can take that cell that was a skin cell, revert it back, and then turn it into a bone or muscle or whatever. And so um, that is, was a really big deal. But also in the process of reverting these cells back to pluripotent stem cells, you're in a lot of ways kind of reversing the clock and putting them back towards a, towards a more primordial state. So, so towards a more resilient and adaptable state because then that cell can go off and become anything else. And so it kind of works by wiping the epigenetic plate sleep, so to say. So it changes the methylation profile of the cell so that different genes can be expressed, and then it can become more like a pluripotent stem cell, and then it can go through differentiation again. The DNA methylates around the different regions that are specific to that cell type, and then it becomes a skin or a bone. And so, um, so yeah, but in effect, though, by doing 
this Yamanaka factor treatment in these cells, we do kind of make them younger in some ways as well. So that was a really, really interesting discovery for which he won the Nobel Prize with Sir John B. Gurdon. And so um, it's, it's a really big deal. And this particular paper's been cited over 30,000 times since 2006. So that's probably 10 times more citations I'll have in my entire career on that one paper. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive. <laughs> so fast forward to 2016, and uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte and his team did a really interesting study that got published in Cell where they took progeroid mice, so took mice that have premature aging, and also took mice that have been naturally aging, and introduced these Yamanaka factors in vivo. So basically introduced them to all the cells in the body. It wasn't done in a super controlled way. But the thought here was that if we could introduce these Yamanaka factors in vivo to a mouse, would it result in the mouse having less of an aging phenotype? So it looked at these different hallmarks of aging, and yes, they found that when you introduce the Yamanaka factors in vivo, that the mice have reduced hallmarks of aging and appear to be younger, they appear to have functional um, outcomes that are consistent with younger mice. And so um, this, this is a very interesting study. And one of those outcomes is actually muscle regeneration. It seems like the muscle visual pair itself a little bit better. Um, so that was really interesting. And this, you know, as I say, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how come we're not doing this? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, some of these Yamanaka factors are on the chat. And so in order to express them in a controlled way, um, well, it's really hard to do that, first of all. And second of all, like, even if you do that, there's a decent chance you cause cancer. So what's the hope here? Well, the hope is that you can leverage what we discover by using these things to figure out what's downstream. And then maybe we can target those things in order to, you know, develop drugs and things of that nature to help reverse aging. And so that's sort of the <laughs> idea. But um, this was kind of a... a oh. <laughs> 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 so, and it actually in uh, 2011, Steve Horvath uh, published his original paper on methylation clocks. He had some data in there where they took mesenchymal stem cells and then they induced pluripotency in those mesenchymal stem cells using the Yamanaka factors and found that the methylation age went back to zero. And so, again, this idea that you can kind of reverse the methylation landscape towards a younger state. And so uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, and I put this, this figure up in jest. I'm sure that Steve will probably be angry. <laughs> but um, all the people I just talked about, Steve Horvath, Juan Carlos Belmonte, Shinya Yamanaka, all work for Altos Laboratories now. So it's a multi-billion dollar startup um, started by, you know, well, allegedly Jeff Bezos and some other folks uh, for the purpose of trying to basically, quote unquote, solve aging. Um, you yeah. know bounds of youth and mortality sort of stuff. So, and, and it's largely based on this Yamanaka factor, right? And so um, it's interesting and hopefully um, it will result in some therapeutics eventually. Uh, so, but it, it's only been going on for a couple of years. They have a couple of different sites around the world. Um, it, it's pretty, they, they basically poached a lot of people from academia to, to go work. In this country. So, um, but yeah, a very interesting, uh, very interesting ideas. <laughs> My idea was much simpler. When you exercise, do any of the Yamanaka factors change, right? So we know that exercise is good for you. We know that it can make your muscle appear younger in a lot of ways and make it more functional. So my question is, can, does exercise in any way manipulate the Yamanaka factors? So that's okay, S and M. And uh, so we went to the literature first and there's this big um, online data set. It's this tool where you can get all of the, the RNA-seq and microarray data from skeletal muscle studies that have been published with relation to exercise, you can go and just query your favorite genes and it'll spit out the results and, you know, have pretty large N, 100. And so um, I just went to that website and plugged in my Yamanaka factors to see if any of these things change in muscle with exercise. And the overwhelming answer was MIT. MIT goes through the roof when you exercise. So if you go do an exercise bout, one of these Yamanaka factors goes sky high. It comes back down eventually, um, but, you know, within 24 hours. But still, MIT is highly, highly responsive to resistance and endurance exercise. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, so then I looked in our, um, our old powertrain mice for MIC levels at the gene expression level and found that yes, MIC was an indeed increased at the gene expression level with the exercise that we gave these mice. So the next thing we had to do was make a mouse model, of course, that's what we do in that one. And so um, what we did is we took that HSA mouse that I talked about earlier, where we can control gene expression and we crossed it to a MIC mouse so that we can control the expression of MIC only in muscle fibers at will. So we can give doxycycline in the water and MIC levels will go up. Then we take the doxycycline away and MIC levels go back down. And doxycycline is just an acronym. But um, 
So yeah, with this tool though, we're able to really exquisitely control MYC in the skeletal muscle fibers only. And this is important because MYC is an oncogene, and if you overexpress it in a lot of other cell types, it will cause cancer. But, uh, but muscle is actually conveniently quite resistant to developing tumors. And so, um, so this is what we did. We took uh, our HSA mouse, we made our, we crossed it with our MYC mouse so we could overexpress MYC. We gave doxycycline in the water overnight, and then we took the doxycycline away, waited 12 hours for MYC levels to come up, and then we harvested the tissue. With the idea of trying to figure out what is MYC controlling at the gene expression level in muscle. It is a transcription factor, and it can drive gene expression. So we wanted to see, okay, well, when we overexpress MYC, what else turns on? What else turns off? That's what we became interested in. So this is just a PCA plot showing you um, what happens on a global scale when we overexpress MYC in the muscle. A um, thousand genes go up and about 400 genes go down, which is quite phenomenal with just one quick pulse of MYC. It controls thousands of genes. So that was pretty amazing to us. And then we compared what genes are expressed when we, when we turn on MYC versus what genes um, turn on with exercise and found there was a pretty good overlap in these genes as well. And so what we think is that MYC is really important for controlling the exercise response. It's a powerful transcription factor. But that doesn't really get to the epigenetic question I've been kind of asking. And so we see this control at the transcriptional level. What about the methylation level? So what we did is we took those muscles where we pulsed just that, did that single pulse of MYC and we sent that out for our RBS just to look at global methylation levels. And yeah, found that the methylome was pretty radically changed just by a single pulse of MYC. And so that's really interesting to, to us because it opens the door to the idea that maybe MYC is an epigenetic controller of exercise adaptation, maybe something that can be leveraged to, um, to study how exercise could reduce methylation aging or reduce different aspects of aging in skeletal muscle. So that's kind of our thinking at this current time. <laughs> so we know that as you age, <clears throat> that your responsiveness to MYC, or mixed responsiveness to exercise training actually goes down. This has been shown in preclinical models. And uh, this was a study here done in humans, young and old people who did a bout of resistance exercise. MYC goes up about six-fold in the muscle when you're young, but only about three-fold when you're old. And as we also know, exercise adaptation goes down the older that you get. So we think that MYC may be an important, um, important player here for exercise adaptation. And if we can manipulate it, maybe we can restore adaptability to exercise, or maybe we can even curtail age-related muscle loss. And so um, this is the working hypothesis. That's kind of what I'm going to leave you on, because truth is, this is what I just got funded for. Everything I just showed you is like the lead up to Hopefully, it will happen over the next five years. We'll discover some new things. Um, but this is the working hypothesis as it stands. On the y-axis, we have muscle adaptability to exercise training. We also have MYC responsiveness to exercise. So when you're young, you go to lift weights. Your muscles grow quite readily. MYC goes up in the muscle quite a lot with exercise when you're young. But as you age, both of those things go down. Adaptability goes down, and your MYC responsiveness to exercise go down. The thought is being that when you get older, Using our tool, our mouse model, we can pulse MYC in these older mice and hopefully restore that exercise adaptability. And then we can do all, all our different molecular measures to see how this is potentially happening. So that's kind of the, um, the overarching kind of theme of what I'll be hopefully working on over the next five years or so. So overall conclusions here. Power is a translatable model of exercise that elicits robust adaptations across muscles of the hind limb in young and aged mice. DNA methylation is altered in myonuclei with exercise training. Late life exercise mitigates DNA methylation age and muscle age mice. Epigenetic rejuvenation rejuvenate, could be mediated by MYC, but we don't know yet. So that's what we're kind of aiming to figure out. <laughs> and the goal here is to kind of tip this scale, right? We have health on this side, we have frailty and morbidity over here. There's a lot of different interventions that we think can tip the scale, exercise, diet. Well, recently there's been drugs or alamycin, that form and all these different things. Cellular rejuvenation, epigenetic reprogramming, which I talked to you about. So what we're trying to do is leverage this exercise component and this component to hopefully tip the scale away from aging and frailty and more towards health. So I very quickly just want to highlight um, the work that we did that kind of led up to what I just showed you. And also, there's a lot of collaborators in here that really need to be called out. Charlotte Peterson, John McCarthy, my postdoc mentors, Corey Dungan, Yuen Lin, who I did my postdocs with. They're now independent faculty, but we still work together. Uh, Chris Fry, University of Kentucky, Stanley Waterwich, and Andrew Demet Wiley at Richline Therapeutics, who I collaborate with. Uh, Steve Horvath at Altos Laboratories. Uh, gosh, I don't want to get into that. But um, 
Yeah, a lot of people have contributed this. And it kind of takes a village to do this type of research. And so um, it's been a really collaborative effort. Burton and Van Walden and, and Sweden, him and I collaborate all the time. Um, yeah, lots of people involved in this. And so it, it's been a really fun adventure to, uh, to kind of try to figure this stuff out with, uh, with a cool team of researchers. If you are interested, ironically, in exercise metabolism, adaptation, skeletal muscle, essentially what you brought me here to talk about, uh, we published a nice nature review a couple months ago with uh, a couple of my collaborators um, overseas, John Osmith, Ken Dyer, and Julian Z. Rath. And so this is a, a monster review with like four or 500 citations. So if you're interested in this type of stuff and exercise metabolism, metabolism uh, with exercise, this would be a great resource for you. And this is my uh, my small but growing team here. This is my lab manager, Sabin, Ron Jones, my second year doc student, PJ, my uh, second year doc student. Uh, we have our funding from the NIHFR, some program money, some uh, some Nathan Chuck Powell Award money. Um, been really fortunate in that regard. Have some great undergrads. Uh, just really trying to build up this team so that we can uh, continue to do this research that I think is a, is a lot of fun. And yep, always looking for talented folks to join the lab, post postdocs. Um, grad students, whatever. So if you're interested, reach out to me, please. And so uh, I think that sort of concludes uh, what I have to tell you guys about. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. We do have some folks watching online mm -hmm. and uh, we do have a question. Lance Bridges is joining us uh, via Zoom. And Lance asks, do you think the relative mitochondrial content increases in the power trained mouse muscle? due to MIC, and have you looked at epigenetic changes in the mitoDNA in addition to myonuclei? Superb work. Thanks. Okay. So the first part there was looking at metabolic changes with power in MIC. So that is, again, one of the aims of the R01 is to really dive into the metabolic aspect because MIC is an important regulator of metabolism in addition to a lot of different things. MIC has tons and tons of functions in the cell. We're finding actually that we think MIC has muscle-specific functions, typically as studied in the context of cancer and tumors and all these different things, but it seems like it has some muscle-specific functions as well, which we're really excited about. And so haven't done that work yet, but it's, it's on the slate um, for sure. And as far as methylation of mitochondria versus nuclear, I mean, I, I've heard people tell me that mitochondrial DNA doesn't get methylated, and I've, I've read some different things about it. We've looked at it in the context of, of power training in aged mice, and we published that um, couple of years ago in aging cell. We did look at it. I don't remember the exact result. I don't know if it changed. I'd have to go back and look. But we did publish that. But as far as have we looked at anything like that, mitochondrial changes versus nuclear changes in the context of MIC and uh, exercise adaptation, haven't gone down that road quite yet. But again, that's the type of stuff that we're hoping to dive into in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, have you seen like the difference between like female and male? Because I know mm. there's some like muscle loss. Oh, absolutely. Really so, with power training, we have trained males and females. I've presented almost exclusively female data. That was for a reason. Females run better, males are lazy and they're sporadic. <laughs> so they, they tend not to run as consistently. Um, so we tend to use females because it's a higher likelihood that we'll get a complete study without having to, you know, have 30 mice in the, the group or whatever. But the males will run. I, I, I have published male data already. Um, they just don't run quite as much. Um, as far as from what I've seen with gross changes, females and males both grow. We don't really see anything too remarkable as far as like one sex adapts less or more than the other. Per se, but we haven't really done it super carefully. Um, and so... For the MIC project, there is a whole exercise training component to that project, um, and the plan is to do both sexes, but uh, we just haven't done it in great detail yet. So it is a good thing to do, um, and I agree that's something that needs to be done, because we do see um, Nick Green, who's my collaborator down in my department, he studies sex differences in the context of unloading and um, cachexia, and he does see huge differences specifically in, in mitochondrial factors. So it's definitely something that's hard. Yeah, I think I was this. Yeah, we do see that at the transcriptional level, all the way up to like mitochondrial function. We have, another, we have another online question. Um, Jeremiah and I seem to be having um, a, a, a similar thought here. Uh, does training type affect the expression of myth? 
So, uh, for example, weighted resistance training versus aerobic training, I would add to that isometric. Yep. Um, so, does is there a difference? It's a horrible question. So, we published a paper last year, two years ago, where we did a time course of the exercise response to an acute endurance and acute resistance exercise. So, we had people come to the lab. I say, Ferdinand, my collaborator at Sweden, he takes biopsies. I don't. Have people come into the lab and um, human beings and we grabbed muscle biopsies from them at baseline. And then they did about a resistance exercise or they did about an endurance exercise. Then we looked at response to a lot of different genes, but Mick specifically we focused on. And with resistance exercise, Mick is sky high. It goes through the roof, at least in the gene expression level, but it goes up to protein level too. And with endurance exercise, for instance, I think it was just 45 minutes of like continuous cycling perhaps. Um, and Mick does go up over that 24 hour time course. We had like a three, a 30 minute, a three hour, an eight hour, and 24 hour time point after exercise. We got really nice temporal resolution of gene expression. And uh, the endurance exercise, we don't see that induction nearly to the same extent. It does go up, but it's much less. And so um, we think that it's more geared towards resistance exercise adaptation. Um, but it's not to say that it's not having a role with endurance exercise. Now, we haven't studied it with isometric or high intensity interval training, all these different things. But in general, if muscle is contracting intensely, MIC tends to go up because it kind of resides at a very low level, maybe even zero in, in skeletal muscle at rest. But when you stimulate it, MIC comes on. And so um, I think we'll probably see that with different ex exercise modalities too. I just haven't um, looked as closely at anything other than continuous endurance versus acute resistance. And did you say that the amount of resistance matters? It's a good question. My knee-jerk reaction would say yes, but I, I don't have the data to, to necessarily uh, back that up. Another question for me? Cool. Uh, so you said that rats were a bit more trainable. So why did you go with mice and rats? Because we want to combine with genetically modified mouse models. Yeah, simple as that. Um, I mean, and rats are more expensive as well. That's, I mean, the main reason why there aren't as many genetically modified rats is because they're more expensive to maintain and more housing, much bigger features. Um, we wanted to be able to use our mouse models that we have all these genetically modified. There's tons of genetically modified mouse models out there. So we wanted to combine that with the exercise. So that was sort of the kind of the driving force there. Yeah. Yeah. So with your power training stuff, did you introduce anything else to keep track of with some different mice, say like introducing different diets or introducing supplements and things like that? Yeah, no, we haven't got that to work at all. Yeah. And it's an important one to go down though, because I, I could here's the thing. Um sorry, here's the thing. Um people in the field started using this. In fact, my master's student, um, he didn't do his master's with me, he was at a different university, and his master's thesis is using the power model. To do something, and he was like waiting the wheel in a different way and messing with it. Um, and then he came, and I was working with me, and we're doing power models still. But um, other folks have looked at it in like the context of like cancer, like if you have cancer and you put a mouse on a power wheel, what happens, right. things like that, but not so much as far as like uh, pharmaceutical or pharmaceutical or like dietary options yet. But I imagine that's not really my area, but I imagine that there are people out there probably want to do that because it is a very, it's a very tractable model. Like it's, uh, it's not a lot of, you don't need a lot of oversight. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that it's not a one-to-one -one of resistance training at all, right? Like, if anything, it's probably analogous to putting on, like, a heavy backpack and walking the you know, like, something more like that, or, like, CrossFit or something, because, you know, it's very high volume, but it's also very high weight. So it's, it's kind of a unique model in that respect, and the adaptations we see are very much similar to what you'd see with athletes. But how you get there is obviously different because people don't train that way. And so that's kind of a, a caveat. You know, I need to be transparent here about the model. There are models that have been developed since we did our power that are pure resistance training, but it's essentially like training a human being. You have to be there for 45 minutes and have the mouse do something very specific repeatedly and coerce them to do it and things like that. And so um, it just depends on what your research question is. If you want to use it, it just depends on um, how much time and resources you have as well. So. Um, so yeah, but no, we haven't done any of that stuff. So so we have another question. Um, Marlis is watching, and Marlis asks, "What was the exercise history of the old mice used in the second experiment? Uh, were these mice mostly sedentary prior to your experiments? Were they couch potatoes, say, or do did they have access to running wheels so they could run if they wanted to?" 
Um, so this population, like humans, some exercise in your life and some don't. It's a great question. And our control for that <laughs> was sedentary mice that hadn't done anything. And the mice themselves that power trained the end of their lives were also sedentary the whole life. So they had literally nothing. So I would equate it to couch potatoes. Um, that's a big question in the exercise field, especially for people who do neuride research or road research, is what is the problem control? Is it a mouse that just has access to an unweighted meal? Is that the control? Or is it a mouse that has access to nothing and it just is in a tiny little cage getting fat for their whole lives? Um, that's kind of a, I don't even know if that's a philosophical question. It's a very valid question. Um, and I mean, for every study you do, though, if you decide to have the wheel running control, the weighted wheel running experiment, and the sedentary, you're adding a lot of groups and lost extra money and all these things. So it's challenging. Um, so the answer to the question directly, though, they were sedentary their whole lives up until they finally got on the wheel. They have a week of acclimation. So usually two or three days are just trying to figure out how the wheel works and they get on there and then they exercise. Um, but yeah, there was no prior training. There was no prior training history there for them. And they were just sedentary. Yeah, on a normal child diet. Any other questions? I'm interested in exercise for people with disabilities. And so in some ways, you know, having a traumatic injury like spinal cord injury is maybe a place to make some of the aging of muscle or things that yeah. are um, curious if you have anything or data center or your thoughts that would indicate you know, so somebody who's 30 years old that has muscle atrophy due to an injury I and they start exercising with that. Right. And could that not only benefit the muscle, but could that benefit other aspects of the health? Right. Like, like methylation aging. Right? Yeah. I don't, I haven't done much in that area, to be honest. I've pretty much stayed in my lane here with this stuff. But I have, I have colleagues and collaborators overseas that are kind of looking at, it's not a spinal cord injury, but like, at, like an atrophy valve. So like, let's say you had to go to bed rest. So they'll, you know, unload the mouse for a couple of weeks and then have it reambulate and then look at like the methylation profile to see did that unloading that brief unloading did it cause a methylation memory that caused them to be more resistant to training um and that's um that's stuff that they're looking at what i've done in the context at least of exercise is i've trained them mice i've detrained them and then retrain them and then look to see if they're more trainable later and then look at the methylation profile, see if there's like a memory of methylation in the muscle. And it does seem that there is, and they hypertrophy and adapt more quickly later down the road if they had trained before. So we call it kind of like muscle memory. But as far as like spinal cord injuries, things of that nature, I haven't done anything in that area and I'm not super familiar with the literature. So, I mean, I understand where you're going, what you're saying. Uh, I, just, I just don't have the files on the answer. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I appreciate what you're what you're trying to guess. To follow up on this question about the, the diet, notice that the ones in the they're not is that limited and they just eat one. They they eat like an extra grant, what they eat five grand. Right, I don't remember. We can put it in a paper. We have it in the paper. But yes, they do eat more. It's not like a huge amount, but yeah, they eat more. For sure. So I I will ask you the last question. Okay. And uh so all of these studies were done with skeletal muscles. Yes. But when they're exercising, is there any impact on things like the cardiac muscle? Did all functional stuff in the back. And yeah, the heart grows like this. In fact, the first time I killed a mouse, first time I harvested tissue. Um, I, I opened up the, the leg and I was like, oh my gosh, the soul, this is twice the size. I could tell right away eventually that it was huge. I was like, okay, this is good. Then I opened up the chest and the heart was massive. And it's not like, it's not, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's volume loading. It's the heart. It's more functional. And we have all of the ultrasound functional type of data mm -hmm. in that paper. So the answer is yes, it's, it's a systemic exercise. Um, and so, and that's not something I didn't really, I, I really ever followed up on because it's not really like my area, but, um. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that if you want to study the heart, power would be a great model too, because it definitely causes like an athlete. So, so I, uh, sorry, I myself, I'm going to ask one last question. <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is there a place for um, 
since you're getting back to pluripotent cells and stem cells and all of that is happening in this process, in some in some case, maybe you could reverse it. Is there a place for what is being called novel alternative methods, organoids, to be used for these kinds of studies? Yeah, I think so. Possibility is pretty cool stuff that you could do in vivo. The thing is with muscle, though, at least the expectation is that we wouldn't revert because it becomes it's multi nuclear. I don't know how you would revert muscle cell with like thousands of nuclei back into a single nuclear where stem cell that requires some sort of weird differentiation process. And yeah, I don't know. But um but for that reason though, it would be interesting to try and figure out if that happens, you know, like if we are introducing Almanac factors into a muscle organ, like could we you know get them to de-differentiate and become mononuclear again and somehow, you know, become a stem cell. That would be wild. And one of my collaborators at Oklahoma Medical uh, Research Foundation recently found and published this last year was that myonuclei are not post mitotic. They actually do synthesize DNA and that they can do this um, through uh, endoreplication. So it's not a new nucleus, it's that you just get more DNA in a given nucleus. And we think it might be related to some of these protein factors. So this is something that we're, we're kind of pursuing, just put it in the ground. So, anyway. well, well, I was like, hey, sorry, that's the, yes, yeah. that's the takeaway. Thank you so much. You're very fascinating. It's been here.